Subsequent astronomers were not content with Ossiander's idea of just this being a predictive tool, and they put it forward as a real description of the universe, and those people were deemed heretics and burnt at the stake. Probably the most famous figure here is an Italian astronomer by the name of Giordano Bruno, who uh, is notorious for, for amongst sci-fi fans, such as myself, for being the first person on record to speculate that there is life on other planets. So if you like stories about aliens, like I do, you might ask yourself, who is the first person to actually put forward this idea that, that there's life on other planets? Well, apparently it's Giordano Bruno. Um, Church didn't like that, none too much. They burnt him at the stake. There's a rumor that a young Rene Descartes actually saw Bruno burn at the stake, but it's probably not true because Descartes would have been about three years old at the time, and so it's, it's unlikely that even if he did see it, he would have remembered it. Ultimately, what happens is 100 years after Copernicus, Galileo Galilei comes along, and he makes substantial improvements to the telescope, and his, he's able to publish findings in support of Copernicus. And after that, it's just, it, 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 sees, it becomes undeniable that Copernicus was right. And the Copernican Revolution, 100 years after the death of Copernicus, finally takes off and becomes canonical established science. Now, for, for this crime, Galileo was, was sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life. You know, uh, Galileo wasn't, you couldn't burn Galileo at the stake because he was actually ridiculously popular and politically very well connected in his own lifetime, which made him, it made him a very difficult target for the church to go after. But at the same time, they weren't going to take it lying down. They probably would have wanted to have burned him at the stake, but they didn't want to make him a martyr. So they sentenced him to house arrest, but they got him to recant first. His defense at trial was very fascinating. He, he wrote to Queen Christina of, of, of Sweden. Uh, uh, his defense uh, of his position was uh, included the following. The Bible is a book about how to go to heaven. It is not a book about how the heavens go. This is a very early anticipation of what Stephen Jay Gould would later call the non-overlapping magisteria view of the relationship between religion and science. The Bible is a book about spiritual matters. It's not a science book. Now, um, so they, they got him to recant. They got him to say, fine, I was wrong. It's not really at the center of the universe. And so they sent him to house arrest. And there's a, there's a story. It's probably false. It's probably apocryphal. But it's such a great story that's worth repeating anyway. The story goes that as he was leaving the courtroom, he turned to, to, to the bailiff, basically, and said to him, it moves regardless. That is to say, the planet Earth moves regardless. Yeah, I just recanted, but you know what? The facts are not dependent on what I say. The facts are the facts, and they are independent of our description of them. And so, even though I just said that, yeah, the world isn't moving, it is. It moves regardless. So if you ever want to give someone a big intellectual middle finger in a debate, and, you know, they're, they're just not getting it, and you know you're right, you just tell them, look, it moves regardless. Maybe I can't convince you, but it does. It moves regardless. Now this sets us up for probably you know the single maybe even the single most important person in the entire history of science, Isaac Newton. Frankly, uh, Newton deserves a whole series dedicated just to himself. If you ever really get a chance to pick up a biography of Newton, he led led a fascinating life, and I can't really recommend it enough. Uh, it's with Newton that we really shift into the age of enlightenment. This is just the golden age for natural philosophers, uh, that is to say, scientists. Uh, so we've completely jettisoned this, this teleological view of science, this purpose-driven view that Aristotle uh, uh, put in, and, and Newton comes along and replaces it with a law-governed view. We start looking for mechanisms. We start looking for mathematical laws that describe the motion of stuff in nature. And that's, of course, where Newton excelled. Uh, among his many contributions was his book, Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, otherwise known as the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. And that changes, well, everything, basically. Science will never be the same. This is probably, you know, easily one of the three most important books in the history of science, maybe in the history of books entirely. Um, it, almost all of our modern technological uh, innovations that we, that we enjoy today trace their origin back uh, to the Principia. It's such an influential book. It transforms physics. It transforms everything. Quick biographical note on Newton. Uh, when he died on his deathbed, uh, you'll never guess what he actually thought his principal, most important accomplishment in life was. It was not the Principia. It wasn't the invention of calculus. It wasn't the laws of motion. It wasn't the laws of optics. None of these massive scientific contributions. Isaac Newton's greatest accomplishment, according to himself, lifelong celibacy. That's right. Isaac Newton dies a virgin. Think about that the next time you start picking on geeks for not getting laid enough. So this, this vision that Newton puts forward as, uh, of the universe as a system that's entirely governed by laws, mechanical laws that can be predicted and described mathematically, is a very powerful vision. 
prior to Newton, science was divided into fundamentally disparate fields. You had celestial mechanics, which was the study of the motion of the stars. And then you had terrestrial mechanics, which was the study of, mo of motion of objects here on Earth. Newton comes along and unifies these ideas. He proposes the universal law of gravitation, which is the first truly universal scientific law. Now, of course, we know today that's not really universal. It doesn't really apply on the quantum level, and it kind of breaks down near singularities and really massive objects and stuff like that. But, you know, hey, let's throw, set that aside for the moment. It's still an amazing accomplishment to even to get a near universal scientific law, it's something that applies everywhere all the time and works the exact same way. Uh, for, for one human being to really come up with and grasp and unify science in this way is such an amazing accomplishment. It, 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 it's impossible to understate how, how brilliant Newton was. Newton's vision of the universe, which is something he actually is inheriting uh, from Rene Descartes, is a position known as mechanism. This idea that the universe is just one big clockwork system of necessary causes and effects. And this, of course, leads to issues of things like the problem of free will and determinism, other philosophical problems, but I want to set these aside for now since I'm trying to focus here on the science, uh, not so much on the philosophy. So, moving past physics now, on to chemistry. Newton, as you probably know, was a practitioner of alchemy, this idea that we can transform one substance into another. We can transmutate lead into gold, for example. Now, alchemy actually really gets kind of a bad rap today. It's portrayed as a pseudoscience, but in fact, a lot of the work done in alchemy was, was necessary for the preliminary work that eventually ended up being morphed into chemistry. In fact, the principal difference between alchemy and chemistry isn't really that sort of, you know, some sort of hard methodological logical difference per se. Um the real difference really had to do with the social structure. Alchemy was secretive. Alchemy had to be sort of kept cloaked in secrecy and, and shared only with a select few people. Whereas chemistry uh, uh, started to pioneer what we think of today as the openness of science. This idea that scientific results are to be shared, they're to be tested by different people, uh, and that everyone can sort of take part in it. The, the, the role of the social structure of science is something I'll come back to in the, in the very next lecture. Um, but for now, I want to say a little bit more about chemistry. W one of the big issues of this period was how do we explain things like fire, for example? How, how, how do we explain this, the idea that, 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 that this, this process of, of wood burning and becoming ashes? And the pr principal theory at the time was what's known as the phlogiston theory. It was proposed by a guy by the name of Joseph Priestley. And his idea was that there was these tiny little bodies inside of all things that are combustible, things like wood and paper and so forth. And when they burn, they are set ablaze and these little phlogisticated things release. Uh, and, and you end up, you know, uh, losing the phlogiston, which is why things like ashes don't burn, because ashes is, is deflagisticated wood, um, which is why, you know, if, if, you, if you close a container and put with a fire in it, the fire will extinguish because it will burn up all the phlogiston in the air and you get deflagisticated air. Now, the phlogiston theory was remarkably powerful and useful for a long time. It was, it, it was canonical science for, 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 for several decades. Um, and it ended up actually being overturned uh, by Fr a French chemist by the name of Antoine Lavoisier, who, who, who actually realized that what Priestley was calling deflagisticated air was really just oxygen. And so while Priestley actually discovered oxygen, he didn't realize what it was. It was Lavoisier who re finally was able to give us our sort of modern uh, 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 theory of oxygen in 1774. This disproves the phlogiston theory. Priestley resisted this. He ended up actually being on the wrong side of history there. But nonetheless, he still has an, a, 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 impressive accomplishments in, in the field of chemistry. And it's actually going to foreshadow one of the difficulties that I'm going to be talking about throughout the... And that is the precise problem with empiricism and the nature of scientific revolutions and how empiricism can make sense of scientific revolutions. Thomas Kuhn is the biggest figure here, so we'll be coming back to this. And we'll be talking about Priestley uh, uh, and Lavoisier uh, when we talk about, about Thomas Kuhn. I want to leave with this dinosaur comic, so if you can pause it here, I'll put a link to it in the uh, in the in the box. But uh, this is really just a hilarious description of uh, of the whole phlogiston fiasco. All right, closing off now, of course, with Charles Darwin and the birth of modern biology. Darwin was inspired by Carl Linnaeus, who was the first person to really develop a, a rigorous biological taxonomy. And so uh, Darwin saw what Linnaeus did; he wanted to become a naturalist. Um, he went on the famous voyage of the Beagle, of course. While traveling on the Beagle, he saw patterns in the organisms around the world and their different environments, how they interbred and so forth. Uh, he, he, he recognized uh, uh, that competition for limited resources would leave only the fittest in a given environment to survive and pass on their traits. 
Um, and, you know, if, if you don't know the basics of, of evolutionary biology, not only have you not taken a biology class, you probably haven't been on YouTube very long. My name is Darwin. Not Darlus. It's also worth noting that, much as Copernicus was not the first person to propose uh, a heliocentric view, Darwin was not the first person to propose a theory of evolution. In fact, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, proposed a similar theory uh, uh, about a hundred years before Charles Darwin proposed such a theory. But much like Copernicus, what Darwin did, it's not just the, the, the idea of evolution, he was the first person to provide a mechanism for it, the, the mechanism of natural selection, and of course a mountain of data to back up and support the theory of evolution. Um, and shortly after Darwin's death, uh, we, uh, the scientific community recognized the significance of Gregor Mendel's work in genetics, and they realized how perfectly it fit with Darwin's theory, uh, and we had what was the so-called neo-Darwinian synthesis, and that really cemented the idea of evolution as being at the heart of modern biology. Uh, to close with uh, the, the famous quote from uh, the Polish biologist Theodosius Dobzhansky, uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And evolution has now become the cornerstone of modern biology and easily uh, one of the most successful theories in the history of science. In fact, uh, this, is, this may sound like an exaggeration, but I, pro I swear to you it's true. We actually have more evidence for the theory of evolution than we have for gravity. Our modern theory of gravity is Einstein's theory of general relativity. And we've got a lot of data to support the general theory of relativity, but nowhere near as much data as we have to support evolution. So there's actually more proof for evolution than there is for gravity. Okay, this closes out our brief tour of science from antiquity up until the beginning of the 20th century. Now I want to pick up with the philosophy of science in the 20th century and beyond. Yeah.